set up, and did you get the guests? and spiritual practices around the world every Sunday, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Progressive Radio Network. You're listening to the Progressive Radio Network, your number one source for progressive commentary.
It was worth some time in an institution like Harvard to really explore, um, you know, the um, the phenomenon of uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And, Indeed. Uh, so that's what. Um, that's what that is. That's what I, uh, I. I remember I had an experience once where I was going um, uh, driving to Northeast Washington. Um, and um, this is before, and one of the reasons why I ended up going to uh, the Divinity School to uh, study Christology within the context of the history of, of world religions. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, 
I was um, uh, driving uh, to the uh, Jesuit uh, house where I was staying, and I was passing the National Cathedral, and way up on the top of the spire, there was a, a blue light. Uh, and, you know, I all of a sudden it struck me, you know, that I was passing a mausoleum to a man that had died 2,000 years ago, and I actually stopped the car, and I, yes. I thought about it for a long time. Um, uh, so um, uh, an academic study seemed to me for two years worth the uh, worth the time. <laughs> I understand, after all, to have history defined essentially by your birth is not a small mark on history at all. No, it's not. I mean, it doesn't really get much larger. I, you know, I'm pressed about that one for sure. It's just funny because uh, historically, and please, since we're on this, why don't we take a moment? Because uh, it's always been so interesting to me. I feel a, a deep kinship with him. The Christian religion was started uh, in his name, but not by him, as far as I know. And also, as far as I know, the first extant text we have referencing Jesus Christ is Josephus from Roman times, which is That's a good correct. some almost 200 years after he said to have lived. Could you comment on that? Well, no, Josephus was in the, um, in the 70s. So it was 70s, about, uh, oh, excuse me, um, within 100 years. years. After. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, with about 40 years. Oh, no, that's absolutely correct. You know, it's, it's worth mentioning that the only major world religious figure that was born in the full light of history was Muhammad. Mm. Jesus, Moses... Abraham, um, Buddha, uh, Mahavira, Lao Tzu. You know, Confucius, Lao Tzu, all were born, lived, and died um, shrouded in uh, mystery. Yes. And uh, in the case of the Buddha, it was it was centuries before things were written down. Lao Tzu remains to this day shrouded in, in mystery. Very true. Um, Some doubt whether he ever lived. Uh, that's exactly right. So, um, you know, the it's, to, speaking of Passover, there is ab absolutely no historical evidence at all, not mm -hmm. a shred, that the Exodus or ever happened or that Moses ever lived. And were it not for Torah, yes, um, there would probably be no uh, memory at all. Mm. And um, you know, it really begs the question. What what determines reality is yes. is the reality of the memory in the Jewish collective psyche um, sufficient um, to determine you know historical Record. certitude mm -hmm. um, is a potsherd you know in an archaeological dig um, yes. Uh, that has sort of Jesus Christ in Greek, does that count? I mean, uh, These you know, are many very good of our, questions, yeah. Um, I was just in um, Haran um, and um, Urfa in Turkey, and there's supposed to be the cave where uh, Abraham was born. Yes. And uh, is that, is, did it really happen there? I mean, you know, there's many, many... Yeah. Uh, questions, questions about these great historical figures. It's I always, very true. by the way, I just have always felt that the uh, greatest mistake that the Jews made was in letting Jesus slip by, uh, slip out, and get <laughs> captured by the Christians. And I mean this yes. both humorously but seriously. I, I think understand. that that for Jesus to be captured by the Christians was a was a historic mistake for which we are. We have paid dearly and are paying very dearly today. I think the power that he represented needed to have been curated within an old culture where wisdom was beginning to take hold. Mm. And I think um, the, um, the Jews quibbled with him for ultimately small reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, had they honored him as they did some of their prophets, not many, but some of their prophets, 
during their lifetimes, I think history would have turned out completely differently. And I think more powerfully, sagaciously, and I think Mm. with greater humility. Mm. Oh, that was beautifully put. I agree with you, Jim. In fact, uh, you are reminding me of my own Jewish Taiji Chuan teacher down in New York City's Chinatown on the Bowery, who many years ago said that the Jews missed Jesus. They missed the true Messiah, of course, in Hebrew, Moshiach, the king. Uh, doesn't mean some being descending from the clouds. It's um, the king of men is really what it signifies. And that had the Sanhedrin at the time recognized Jesus for being who he was because they were always on the search for a Messiah, had they recognized that in him, because he certainly fit the criteria, and they have criteria, like a legal document of who fits the requirements and conditions of a Messiah. If they had recognized him, yes, history would have fleshed out entirely differently, which is, in effect, the point you're making. Are you there? Yes. Um, it, I'm, I'm essentially corroborating from another point of view uh, yeah. the same notion that history would have shown itself to be very different. We would have been on a very different tack if the rabbinical court, the Sanhedrin, would have recognized Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And I don't mean to make that sound overly weighty in the way the, let's say, Christian right describes it today, but rather Messiah as in Hebrew Moshiach, meaning king as in king of men. Well, you know, I think it's worth um, thinking through for a moment here. I'm probably other things we need to discuss, but, uh, you know, I think that, you know, it's not altogether clear that Jesus himself felt that he was a Messiah. I think that the, the, the right. dialectical tension that, the, that occurred between Jesus and the Pharisees and the Sadducees at the time was of a more doctrinal nature, and the latitude that the Orthodox um, uh, Jews were willing to give to a man who was um, reinterpreting um, Torah in light of the command to love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, you know, was it is it a sin to do good on the Sabbath? Well, that's ultimately a quibble. That's not really a, 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 a debate True. over which you start to conspire with the Roman overlords to crucify this man. Correct. You know, and I think had there been a genuine willingness on the part of the, the, uh, church, the, the, the Jewish hierarchy to engage with him in a serious manner, I think he would have infuse new life into Judaism right at a moment when it really needed it, and we could have avoided this entire, I think, ultimately spurious um, discussion about whether he was God or not God or the Messiah mm. or not God. I don't think he had any pretenses to be. I think yes. that was something that emerged in the mind of those who had other motives yes. at heart, much more having to do with the acquisition of power. Yes, economics and politics. Yeah. I would agree with you completely. Well, actually, that last point, Jim, bears some relevance to a direction that I would like to uh, steer this discussion. I just want to say, relative to your experience recently in Turkey, uh, exploring that cave said to be the place, do you say, of... Abraham's birth? Yeah. Is that what you said? I was just some months back in an area of China said to be the place of Lao Tzu's ascension. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, life, heard life is even fun. There's a little plaque where <laughs> they say that Abraham realized monotheism. 
<laughs> That's wonderful. It that should be the spot. <laughs> that marks the spot, right? It should be commemorated. So to bring this idea of power brokering forward, because of a lot of your work, America as Empire and subsequent work that you have spent a lot of time at over the course of your professional life. I'd like to speak about this whole idea of power brokers, especially in today's world where there's becoming greater transparency. Thank goodness the veil is being lifted. But I would like to hear what you have to say about really the exchange of a negotiation of power. After all, you have been quite close to Mikhail Gorbachev for many years. You were serving as president of the State of the World Forum in conjunction with him. Could you speak a little bit about what it is you see, and then we'll go from there into where do you think we're going? Well, I mean, I think that um, the situation in the world today, I think, is one of um, very grim portent. And what I mean by that is that I think that after, you know, four or five centuries now of the Industrial Revolution, we're putting so much uh, carbon dioxide into the uh, atmosphere that at a rate of about 100 million tons every 24 hours that we're radically destabilizing the atmosphere through global warming. Mm. And um, we are changing the actually the pH content of the oceans, which absorb 40% of the CO2 that we put up into the atmosphere. It goes into the oceans yes. as well as into the atmosphere itself. It's, it's acidifying. And, yeah. And I think that in terms of power, you know, what we have is uh, the American Imperium at its last stages of ossification. <laughs> where what you you have um, taking place um, in the world right now is a classic example of an Im imperial structure in radical decline. Mm. Um, All you know, Rome. Look, well, yes, I mean, uh, just looking at it from a... a kind of a categorical uh, point of view, if you, if you look at any... Uh, history of the uh, rise and fall of empires. There's what they historians call the imperial arc. Empires rise, they hold power for a certain period of time, and then they fall. There are no exceptions. So the only question that an empire has once it's reached its apogee moment is how long it's going to endure before it falls. And if you look back over history, empires... Are you, are you referring to uh, the work of Arnold Toynbee? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at his study of history, he... Okay. Uh, Jim will be back momentarily. Interesting. So it's the rate of decline, not whether there will be a decline, Jim is saying, but what is the rate of decline? Let me inform you all that you are listening to Mitchell J. Rabin on A Better World on Progressive Radio Network. You can always reach us at our website at www.abetterworld.net, where we are building a community of like-minded, and not always like-minded, but people who care about the world, who care about the earth, and want to make a difference. They want to get educated, and they want to participate. That's what A Better World is largely about, to educate, uplift, and inspire. So please become part of our world at A Better World. Again, that's www.abetterworld.net. We are just bringing Jim back. Katie is hard at work at it, and he'll be with us in a moment. But this is a little station identification. So, Jim, as you were saying. Well... I mean, look it was the, the rate United of States. decline, essentially what we're looking at, what distinguishes one falling civilization, to use the word rather loosely, uh, or another, is the rate of its decline after its apogee. Right. And so if you look at what the United States uh, 
Well, let's let's back up a moment, because this is a very important point for every single citizen of the United States. Mm. What was the difference between, say, the Nazis, whose imperial thrust lasted 12 years till Hitler blew his brains out on April 30th, 1945, and Rome, which uh, lasted well over a thousand years uh, in terms of its imperial sway? The Nazis um, concentrated all their imperial might in the army. And what Rome did is they concentrated their imperial might in two ways. One, they had their legions, but they also built institutions that the conquered people fundamentally experienced as fair. There was one point... Um, uh, in the Roman Empire in the second century A.D., where one could travel from England to Germany to Spain along North Africa into the eastern Mediterranean with one law, one language, and one coinage. That's a feat mm-hmm. that has never been replicated even to the present day. Yes. And um, so it was the capacity, the genius of the Romans was in building institutions that were experienced as fundamentally fair. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at... And and people and public serving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, In the uh, uh, New Testament, for example, there's the story of Paul uh, being beaten um, and uh, saying to the Roman centurion, listen, you can't do this. Here's my papers as a Roman citizen. Uh, I appeal to Caesar. And the, the Roman centurion in Syria had to take a completely anonymous man all the way to Rome because he demanded it as a Roman citizen. That's an extraordinary oh. legal system that would sanction that. Yes. Now, if you look back Very over the last... Um, 75 years in the United States, you see a perfect example of an imperium in ascendancy and decline. Look what Roosevelt did. As the United States came out of the Great Depression, what did he do in the New Deal? He built the institutions that created the basis of the American strength at home with Social Security, the reform of Wall Street, all the major institutions. The TVA. All of it, TVA, everything. He built institutions. Then, uh, with the Second World War and in its aftermath, almost every major international institution from the United Nations to the IMF, the World Bank, the GATT, um, you know, the International Airport um, uh, Coordinations uh, and Associations, et cetera, were all built under the aegis of American a kind of imperial power. We had our legions around the world. Supremacy. But we were building institutions that, like the United Nations, that the world fundamentally experiences as fair. Yes. But look what's happened under Bush and now under Obama. It is the complete dismantling of the institutions inside the United States that have protected the American poor and the American middle class. There is the dismantling abroad, particularly under the Bush administration, of almost every international institution that American power Mm. under Roosevelt and Truman um, lifted up. Exactly. Like the Geneva Convention. Pardon? Like the Geneva Conventions. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what you have in the United States today is imperial overreach abroad, accentuating military supremacy and the gutting of international institutions that we consider to be an impediment to the full scope of our military projections. And then internally, we're literally gutting um, uh, Medicare, we're gutting Social Security, we're gutting um, the capacity of the middle class to live normal lives with the uh, subprime mortgage scam. You know, we're gutting the capacity of Americans to own their own homes. So what do you have? You have that classic situation that Toynbee says is the critical ingredient before the fall. The United States is now losing all its elasticity. It's overextended uh, abroad. 
it is now completely hollowed out um, internally. And in fact, the, the S&P today lowered the U.S. credit rating Did it really? from stable to negative, even though it kept its AAA rating. It's basically saying that because of the indebtedness of the United States, we have a negative long-term future. That's the S&P. I mean, oh this is God. like Standard and Poor's. This is this exactly. is this is the United States downgrading itself. Exactly, it's a venerable our, American institution. Exactly, exactly. With a vested interest in our supremacy. Yeah, exactly, mm. exactly. But so egregious have we become internationally and disengaged. I mean, we don't have politics in this country anymore. We have madness. Yes. What's going on in, the, in Washington right That's now true. between uh, Barack Obama, who's got to be the biggest disappointment in modern American history, yes. and the Republicans who have now gone into the lunatic right-wing fringe, yes. um, is, is a madness has descended upon the nation. And if you read Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, you, you look back over history, you say, how are these people so stupid? Yes. Well, look at the news in the United States today. Yes. You say, how are these guys... How can they gut Social Security? Medicare, how could they gut exactly. Medicare? How, how could they, in the face of what's happening, how could they continue to lower the corporate taxes and the taxes of the richest of the rich? I mean, even against even against the protest of the super wealthy, many of whom have come out publicly and said, we don't even want these because they make no difference in our totally. lives. Warren totally. Buffett, Bill Gates, and totally. others. Right? Totally. Yeah. This is what and we're doing. And meanwhile, with. Yeah. The, our military expenditures have grown Increased. 81% in the last 10 years, and they continue to escalate. Yes. And we are now not only content to be in Iraq, and uh, the Secretary of Defense Gates has indicated that we want to stay there now indefinitely. Correct. And that we're in Afghanistan, we're now diving into Libya. Exactly. It, so, if, I have a question behind all of this. You're making excellent points, Jim, all of which I totally appreciate and am on board with, and I make them in my own newsletters and broadcast routinely in different respects. What is, and you say mad, and it's true, I call this, among other things, the pathology of the affluent. And yet, there has to be a way around this. I mean, look at Walker in Wisconsin. Look at Ryan in Congress. This, as you say, is a lunatic fringe. Who do they represent? And how are they really getting, besides the Koch brothers, and how are they really getting away with it more than anything? What is the solution? I appreciate the historical perspective tremendously, and we have so much to learn from it. What can we, as Americans, and altogether largely humans, do at this point in time? Well, uh, this may be a bit controversial, but I personally believe okay. that we have passed the point of no return. Mm. And let me unpack that Please. for a moment. That's I believe powerful. that yeah. the the administration of Barack Obama was the last moment that America had to redeem itself. Mm. And I think that, as you remember, in 2008, Barack Obama rose up. We discarded Hillary Clinton, who was um, the obvious choice. We've, we opted uh, as Democrats for the audacity of hope. And um, mm -hmm. everybody in the United States, I think, knew that radical social and political transformation was needed after eight years of the egregious politics of George Bush, oh, and the yes. deceptions and the lies and the, the corruption of the American spirit at the hands of, of George Bush. True. And, in fact, the world was so enthusiastic that they basically awarded him the Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> before exactly. he even took office. Exactly. Such was the expectation of a Rooseveltian yes. transformation of politics in America. And the fact that 
that uh, Barack Obama completely surrendered to the vested interests, surrendered, yes. sold out to Wall Street, um, sold out to the military, um, sold out basically to the vested interests and has not had a, a, a shred of, of any really meaningful reform, particularly on, on climate change or financial reform. Um, I think from a, uh, a, again, a historical psycho psychohistorical point of view mm-hmm. is the reason why we've gotten the Tea Party. Yes. You know, when, when, when history zigs and it should have zagged, mm-hmm. it causes a consternation in the polity. I mean, look at all the frustration on the progressive left. Look at yes. the frustration on the right. There's, there's now consternation in the land, and I think it's due ultimately... Oh, for some reason, we're having some technical challenges here. But let me remind you all that you are listening to Mitchell J. Rabin on A Better World with our guest today, Jim Garrison. He is the president of Wisdom University and a, with a distinguished background in so many areas that have all, as you can tell, aggregate into a, a very learned gentleman with some very strong perspectives and outlining an historical perspective for us all, tracing the movements of empires that follow a certain historical cycle. And that's where we are right now looking at the Obama administration, as you could almost say the last hurrah, the last, uh, the last choice, the last chance he is saying rather controversially, it's true, that America would have had to, would you say, redeem itself. Please go on, Jim. Yeah, so, um, you know, when, when choices are made in one's personal life and uh, when choices are made in history, you can't make a choice, make a decision, and go down the road and say, oh, wait a minute, I, I want to change my mind. <laughs> right. That's not the way... The universe is constructed, and I think the demise of, of, of Barack Obama is going to now condemn. He may squeak. I don't think he deserves a, a second, second term. term. He may squeak by, but I mm-hmm. think at least until um, 2016 now, the United States is, is going to be condemned to the politics of paralysis precisely at the moment when the world and the United States needed a new Roosevelt. It yes. needs a decisive, visionary, transformational oh. leader. So I think that what's, when I say we've passed the point of no return, I think that what is, uh, is now inevitable is a cascade of crises that are going to emerge probably out of the climate and the ecology that are going to devastate the United States and can tr- increasingly devastate the world, just like the earthquake, tsunami, and meltdown is currently devastating Japan. You know, in the last 25 years, the number of extreme weather events has quadrupled. Greatly. And that's what global warming and climate change means. That's right. In effect, climate change is turning into climate shock. Mm-hmm. And in the face of that, Every government in the world, led by the United States, is refusing to take any uh, action. decisive action. That's correct. So the situation objectively is getting worse and worse. And meanwhile, all the U.S. government can do, like as you're seeing in, in, in Wisconsin, is hollow out the capacity of, of, of ordinary people to lead meaningful lives, yeah. break the unions, destroy Social Security and, and Medicare in this delusional politics called um, deficit reduction. It's so interesting, uh, Jim, that the Republicans, uh, while I am so not interested in the polarity between these two, and I generally endorse Ralph Nader's perspective of twiddly D and twiddly dumb, you can hardly tell the difference between them. But now, because of this polarity around the budget issues and the union issues, there actually is a rather stark polarity going on that we're facing. Uh, Nonetheless, uh, I like to tell my audience that I was not for an Obama 
White House. I was for a Dennis Kucinich White House, coupled with, interestingly, controversially, Ron Paul. And I had a <laughs> very, exactly, you got it. I had a very, uh, I feel, noble psychological impetus toward that because I don't like blue, I don't like red, I wanted purple. And I wanted to create symmetry from lateralization in the global American mind and melt those differences of Democrat and Republican into one single administration. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that. But here, we really are moving along a, a certain axis, if you will, which is suggesting that the politics of people, devastating and grim as you're making, uh, you're making it uh, clear that it is, I truly believe it is, is going to be really subordinated to a much larger picture having to do with our relationship to the earth herself. And I know that's a lot of the work you do at Wisdom University, and I believe is hinted in the title of your upcoming book, Climate Change in the Primordial Mind. And I get a sense that there is an indigenous wisdom that you are beginning to call forth that goes far beyond beyond our absurd pathological politics and sense of self-importance and a return, if you will, coupled with our current intelligence and, and technology uh, and all of that, to come to another relationship altogether relative to our stewardship, something that I've been calling and is a chapter in my book called Sacred Stewardship, which I feel is the direction we must go in and all world politics, all human activity will become subordinate to. Absolutely. Your comments? I, yeah, well, I think there's a, a couple of points. One is that I think, uh, as you no doubt have been talking in terms of various programs that you've had. The issue of global warming and climate change is the human issue yes. confronting the human race, in the face of which every other issue is marginal. True. I mean, we now have increased global temperatures uh, over one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And so we've literally given the Earth a fever. Mm. You know, if you or I had a uh, temperature right now of about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, we probably wouldn't be on this call. <laughs> Very true. And uh, so the Earth is reacting uh, just like the oceans are. Um, in a very kind of increasingly turbulent way. I mentioned the, the quadrupling of the uh, number of extreme weather events. Mm -hmm. uh, another um, uh, issue is the beginning of the rise of the sea levels. Yes. You know, if all the ice melted off of the two poles, the Antarctic and the Arctic and Greenland, sea levels would uh, go up between uh, 75 and 100 meters. Um, some government scientists are beginning to predict that by 2050, we're going to get sea level rises around the United States of at least six inches. So just, just imagine for a moment what it would mean if all the coastal cities on the west and east coast begin to be flooded. Yes. And where, where would those people, where would the 20 million people in metropolitan New York go, San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles, San, San Diego, Diego. Uh, Houston, uh, Miami, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, there's 181 um, major cities around the United States coasts that um, comprise uh, well over 50 percent of the uh, U.S. Population. population. So we're looking at basically the collapse of um, civilization as we know it. Then, if in the face of that, you've gutted all your social welfare agencies, you have, in going back to Toynbee, no elasticity left. Yes. And so this is, a, this is a serious, serious issue. Now, the second point that I think, uh, again, uh, as difficult as it is, must be made, is the, basically the issue that we've passed the point of no return. There's now so much CO2 being generated. The governments of the world have been so negligent in their responses that the amount of CO2 that's already in the atmosphere 
uh, well over 1.5 trillion tons is causing um, the turbulence that we're experiencing today. And even if we stopped tomorrow morning, you would still have a rising crescendo of um, extreme weather events and earthquakes. There was a report just released two days ago uh, saying that the uh, climate change now is being associated with earthquakes because you're again it, when you have a fever in your body everything yes. starts to kind of tremble tremble and including um the tectonic plates yes and so we have to get really get serious as uh human beings that i believe that james lovelock's mm -hmm. uh prediction he wrote the gaia the book Gaia and the, is responsible right. for the Gaia hypothesis, sure. now the Gaia theory. And mm -hmm. he probably knows more about climate change than anyone I personally know. Mm -hmm. uh, having studied the Earth's ecology, the atmosphere in particular, and also the oceans. And he predicts that if current trends per, uh, continue, and, uh, and no one, whether Barack Obama or President Hu in China or Sarkozy in France, there's not a single major world leader on the stage today that's doing really anything to stop the radical uh, uh, increase in our, uh, our uh, CO2 emissions. He believes that by 2100, roughly 80% of the human race will have been killed off or have died off for, by three interrelated factors. One, climate catastrophes. Mm -hmm. Two, the spread of infectious diseases. Uh, and three, um, the conflicts and wars that will ensue because of the massive migrations of people. And, I and, the, de that, and the demand for water. And the demand for water, absolutely. The Ogallala Aquifer under, you know, most of the Midwest and Texas is about 95 percent depleted. Oh, my God. And um, so we, we need to really internalize that we are, we are facing a, a, a catastrophic system failure. Completely. And that we need, therefore, to answer your earlier question, it's no longer, to me, sufficient to try to lobby your congressman, because the, the, the Congress on both sides of the aisle, including the presidency, have basically been bought out True. by the financial interests. And I would recommend that anybody doesn't either, uh, if you don't understand or agree with that, go see the, the movie Inside Job, mm -hmm. which just lays out in a single documentary that got the Academy Award this last yes, uh, year. It sure did what it means when you say that the financial interests have bought out the government of the United States. We've essentially had a coup. Yes. And uh, it wasn't a military putsch like in the, you know, the mm. 30s or the overthrow right. of one party by another. It was the buying out exactly. by Wall Street of the two major parties in the United States exactly. and the presidency. Exactly. And so elections continue to happen, but it doesn't make any difference because everyone's basically sold their souls with very very few exceptions very true and so and what, very little way to make a structural exactly, change exactly because it's so, all paid for by Goldman Sachs and brothers yeah, that's exactly right so what what can one do I believe that the only thing realistic to be done under current circumstances mm -hmm. is to build resilient community Yes. And let me give you a historical, I know we're running up against the hour, mm -hmm. and I apologize, my phone has died. I don't know what the problem has been, but let me give you a historical I'm glad you came here. back. Please do. In uh, <sighs> Right at the moment of historical analogy, which will really help us come to greater grip with this truly devastating situation that you regular listeners know we address routinely, not as articulately as Jim Garrison is doing here today, but certainly richly, and I would 
dare say poignantly. Why? Because we must face these deep issues. We must. Oh, you know, I dance around the edges of them with a little lightness and humor. And I think about Robin Williams' great line of what we're facing here is not global warming, but global grilling. And I personally think humor is one of the chief ways we're going to wiggle out of the situation because sobriety doesn't really seem to do it. Jim, please continue with that poignant comment. So St. Benedict, who founded the Benedictine Order, yes. looked at the situation of the fall of Rome, and he realized, with the barbarians on the frontier, that the, the projection of civility and morality on the imperial institutions was a mistake. And so he founded the Benedictine Order as, a, as an attempt to build resilient community in the mm. face of the decline of the Imperium. The major difference between Rome then and St. Benedict then and our situation now is he saw the barbarians on the frontier. We have been ruled by the barbarians for some time. Yes. And it's our lack of our appreciation of that that really constitutes the major part of our predicament. So what Wisdom University is doing um, and what I've been spending much of my time doing is calling upon people to understand the gravity of the situation that we're in and to join the transition movement, to start thinking through how you return to the land, mm. how do you have a, um, a, a community of people um, that you're starting to interact with and coalesce a solidity with, Mm -hmm. So that as the turbulence continues to rise, which is now inevitable, we can begin to have the capacity, like the Benedictines, because we formed community, to navigate through. You know, just because it's Passover, a closing image is, is from Genesis and, and Joseph and the Pharaoh and the mm -hmm. dream of the Pharaoh, the seven fat cows and then the seven thin cows and the thin cows ate the fat cows. It was that there was time of plenty and then there was going to be a time of real famine. Mm. We are at the end of the seven years of plenty. Mm. It's giving way to the time of real sorrows. And we have just enough time, I think about 24 to 36 months to really take seriously building resilient community mm. before I think the turbulence is going to get very, very heavy. And mm. I think what we're seeing in Japan um, is just the foretaste of things to come. And, um, and so resilient community is where I'm putting uh, almost all my time and attention. Mm, that's a really intelligent choice. I think we had David Corton on not that long ago, speaking in some way about building local economies, which is all really about local eating, local loving, local friendship and family and building these tightly knit survival based, if you will, communities that are organic in nature. So it's an idea whose time has come. Let me ask you before you leave about your relationship with Gorbachev, who, of course, was, uh, of course, in power some years back, but he is still a man of great prominence. What of men like him who see the larger picture and have the ears of those in power or I would imagine have some. What is he doing in light of all that you've been sharing? Because I know it's a shared perspective due to the work you both collaboratively do in the State of the World Forum. Well, we've had a, a very long, very robust and dimensionalized friendship. Uh, I uh, first met him at the end of 1991. In fact, I was the last foreigner to um, see him in his Kremlin, Kremlin office before he resigned on oh. December 24th, 1991. My. And one of the things that I, I would note about Gorbachev um, is that he was a man of such strong moral courage. 
if you if you look at the history of his six years in office, particularly according to Alexander Yakovlev, who was on the Politburo mm-hmm. and was one of his, you know, was really the triumvirate, part of the triumvirate. It was Gorbachev, obviously, as president, Shevardnadze as the foreign minister, and Yakovlev as the major figure in the Politburo that really governed the Soviet Union during the Gorbachev years. And, and, and Yakovlev told me once that not once when there was a situation of uh, tension when the KGB and the military were recommending to the president that he come down as the Soviets had done from Stalin onwards in mm-hmm. a, in a, in a uh, heavy-handed, murderous way, Gorbachev always said that true power is political power where you work through your differences in a democratic and nonviolent way. Mm. And I, I, I learned deeply that lesson from him, that no matter what the tension, no matter how you're uh, tempted to use uh, violence, that if you think about it long enough, there's always a much more creative way to deal with the situation. And I must say that's in some ways informing me as I try to deal with climate change. You know, yes. at some point you realize that you can't bang your, there's no point in banging your head against the wall of trying to change interests that are now completely corrupted by yes. Wall Street. Yes. But what is another creative way to do it? Well, you can join the transition movement. You can do what uh, David Corton has suggested and start developing local economies. You can start to build communities to go off grid. Yes. Um, there's, there's, every crisis is laced with all kinds of opportunities. And yes. I have never actually felt more abundant and, or optimistic in my entire life than all of a sudden when I realized that uh, I don't have to try to change the system. What I have to do is try to change me. Yes. How liberating, truly. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. You know, Jim. St. Benedict was right. <laughs> yes, indeed. And make Benedictine as well. Listen, what is a website where people can learn more about both Wisdom University and this transition movement? Well, uh, Wisdom University, uh, just go to www.wisdomuniversity.org. And uh, for the transition movement, um, I think it's transitionmovement.org. But you can Google it, and and a lot of sites uh, will come up. It was started in in England by a guy named Rob uh, Hopkins about 10 years ago and is now spreading all over the United States. And it's a very exciting, very you know, locally rooted uh, movement. Yes. Uh, in Wisdom University, we've been starting what we call Wisdom Earth Circles of, of bringing students and alumni and just interested people together around not just circles, but circles that are connected to the earth. Indeed. Uh, I think that's so important to engage in Listen, that thing. Listen, would you, would you come back onto the show on another occasion and we can go into greater depth about that? I would love to. Yeah. Excellent. Jim Garrison, thank you so much for being a guest on today's show. We've run out of time. Let this not be a metaphor for what will happen in the way we take care of our Earth and each other. I wish you all a happy Passover. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. Thanks for joining us. Visit us at our website at www.abetterworld.net. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Good night now. Thanks to the...